Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company. And today we have Carl Baker to keep us company. Uh, he's a senior advisor for the SPIC Forum. And we appreciate him coming on the show today. We're going to talk about China. China is a moving target. And we have to keep track of all the changes. And it seems to be more moving and more difficult to keep track. Welcome to the show, Carl. Good to be here, Jay. It's always a pleasure to talk to you about what's happening in the world. Yeah, well, we haven't we haven't covered um, you know the moves in China in a while. Although China is definitely the eight hundred pounder all over Asia and maybe the world, um, but there are things happening in China that are different than the last time we covered it. And um, you know, the press in China, as it is in Russia, is not very independent. So we don't know if we're getting the whole story, and that makes it even more interesting. So what is happening in China these days? There are, there are things that are of some concern. How do you feel about that? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty vague, vague statement. And, you know, as you, know, you say that we aren't sure that we understand what's happening, and we are dependent on the media. And we're also dependent on the Western media, which is always quite eager to find problems in in China. And so, you know, so what what we see in the western media today is that the, the economic are every, economic problems are everywhere. The real estate market is is collapsing. The debt burden is becoming greater. Consumer spending is weak, you know, uh, and so, you know, all these things I think are sort of playing into a a mindset in in the West and specifically in the United States for us is that maybe maybe China is going to go the way of Japan in the 90s. You know, maybe it's 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 uh, it's it's moment is over that China is is now at a turning point. The population is shrinking because of the one uh, one child policy that was in place. They're, they're they're aging faster than probably anybody else in Asia, and that certainly will be the case in the next in the next 20 years as the as, as the generation of the one child policy uh, become become middle aged you know there's 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 not this replacement generation to take over so you know i think that that in china there there is certainly economic concerns but i think when you when you talk to people in china they're also concerned about what's happening with with xi jinping you know sort of taking taking a, a strong one man leadership role that we've kind of lost the opportunity for succession. Uh, they're concerned that that there's too much emphasis on the party, that the party is 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 trying to sustain itself at the expense of the country. You know, I think that, that there is a there is some sentiment among among the Chinese people that that express that. Of course, you don't see that in the Chinese media, as you suggested at the at the top. That the, certainly the, the the Chinese media is trying to portray everything as normal. Everything is fine. We have the Global Security Initiative. We have the Global Development Initiative. We have the Global Cultural Initiative. China is becoming more powerful. China is is developing a whole system of mechanisms that are outside of the Western dominated uh, global institutions. And and China is the emergent leader in of the global South. So I think you know those are kind of the conflicting stories, and they are all moving targets for us. I think. Yeah. Well, let's let's uh, look at these um, negative things. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and we don't know exactly uh, whether they're hand-picked stories um, by a press that can't really get into China. You know, that has to deal on uh, kind of hearsay reporting. But um, you know, what, I'm just picking one out of the out of the sky here. Uh, India seems to be emerging. It seems to be um, looking for China's lunch, so to speak. Uh, it is active in these organizations. Modi is getting around. Modi is well liked. Um, and aside from you know suppression problems, oppression problems in China, uh, Xi Jinping is looking pretty negative these days. Um, you know what he did, what he is doing in Hong Kong, did not endear him to the world. Um, the stories of uh, of the uh, Uyghurs did not endear him to the world. Um, the debt trap problems with uh, the Belt Road Initiative did not endear him. And in fact, in uh, Italy dropped out of Belt Road. 
Um, so he's losing momentum. In the, in, uh, Italy is an important leg in the journey once you get to Europe, um, because it is just south of the Alps. Uh, and if you want to get to Spain, for example, which I understand was uh, China's uh, destination there, you, you have trouble getting to Spain if you can't cross Italy, if you can't cross Italy. So, uh, and then of course, uh, uh, India is doing its own Belt Road right now, which pulls the rug out from the Chinese Belt Road. And they, they're moving west with a, their own kind of infrastructure initiative from India to Europe. So um, the Chinese no longer have a monopoly on that idea. Um, well, and of course, yeah. one thing you didn't mention is, is, is the health issue in China, but we should, we should talk about that too. What about the health issue? Well, you know, they're having problems with uh, the reemergence of COVID, and people really didn't like what happened. Oh yeah, just just the the the, the COVID zero policy certainly, and, and that certainly had an impact on the economy. And I think that's part of the, part of why they're having the economic problems. You know, so so yeah, I think that uh, certainly certainly Xi Jinping has has not endeared himself to the West. But I, I think I would I would warn you that I I don't know that that's translated into the global south. You know, there's there's something very attractive about about Xi Jinping to to the African countries to the Middle Eastern countries, where you know they see this as an alternative to the Western dominated uh, institutions. So you know, you look at what happened at BRICS in South Africa. Well. It certainly wasn't the success they were hoping for. Probably they they did add six members, you know, and they come from from South America, from the Middle East. Uh, they didn't include Indonesia, which I think was would have been the big feather in the cap if they had managed to do that. But you know, so they 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 did expand. They did expand BRICS, and certainly that again, you know, you've got the Chinese media pumping that as a success story, while. The, the 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 West and what we see in in the Western media, you know, they're they're sort of downplaying that aspect of it. So, you know, I think that that again, it, it's really it really have to be careful that we 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 understand when we explain the failure in in Italy, and it, and it was a failure. And you know, you look at at how how the Belt Road Initiative has really sort of dried up as as a as a source of of soft power for the for the Chinese because. They, they found out that there is problems with with the debt trap diplomacy that that the West likes to call it. When really, you know, what what I think, what I see from from the Chinese side is they've come to discover that there really is a problem with investing in Africa. That that it's more difficult than just building stadiums and building you know uh, easy easy asks from from dictators. That you don't really get much out of that beyond a, a big expensive building or a, or a long a long road or a nice railroad that sort of deteriorates because they don't have the maintenance to to maintain it so you know so i mean we've we've any number of empires have have fallen trapped to that you know and i think that china is now realizing that that the, the belt and road initiative is another example of, of trying to overextend that that, uh, that that infrastructure development as a way to to success, you know, but but the broader problem again in China, you know, is really this this dilemma that they're facing, and and it is the dilemma that Japan faced in the '90s: is how long can you sustain this this export driven economy without de developing a strong consumer demand? And that gets back to your health problems, you know, and the health issues and and the economic issues. Is that you know it, they're having a very difficult time establishing that that consumer economy. You know, if you look at, at the, the, the trade balance between the United States and, and China, you know, it's still way skewed to the to the Chinese side. What 2022 or 2020, yeah, 20, 2022, 154 billion into China and 537 billion out of China in the trade balance. You know, so it's a huge number of, of in, in the trade, but it's all consumer products leaving China coming to the coming to the United States. And, and also, of course, to the rest of the West. So you know, so China is still really struggling with trying to trying to get beyond infrastructure uh, development as a, as a source of GDP growth, 
and and you know in many in many ways Belt and Road was was an extension of that, trying to export that 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 infrastructure development as a way to continue GDP development. So you know so I think that, that that's really where the the heart of China's problem is 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 figuring out how to how to sustain a, a or how to develop a sustainable economy. You know, I, I recall that a part of the, um, you know, the fundamental politic of China is you can be the leader and you can have the power and as much as you want, as long as you make us happy. And happy means economically successful. Mm -hmm. And if we are not happy and economically successful, we're going to turn over the government one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And I think that 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 formula is probably still in the DNA of the country. And sure. here we have, now, although we may or may not believe the Western press about Xi's problems, um, mm -hmm. we know at least he has some problems, and they are felt by uh, the men and women on the street of China. They're, they're not completely oblivious um, to the things that are reported in the Western press. Um, and maybe the, that concern you described about whether you know he has a succession or not, whether he's succeeding or not, um, is is undermining his ability to stay in office and undermining the government. What do you think? Well, it, it's it's undermining the party. I mean, I think I think the real the real challenge in, in China isn't isn't sustaining the government. You know, as 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 it is sustaining the role of the party as the center of all policy. You know, be, I mean, because that's that's where Xi, Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping's power resides is within the, within the party. The government is is an is really an, an appendage of the party apparatus. So you know, you you have this this government, and you can you can switch ministers pretty much at will as long as you have adherence to the, the party as as the central authority, and so I think I think that that and I think that's the concern among the people in in China is is the party is is too powerful and and it does it does stifle any any d discussion and any opportunity to to change things in China. So I think I think that the, the real problem for Xi Jinping is is how do you how do you continue to manipulate the party in such a way that people don't begin to resist the party guidance that is driving everything within the government. I have an answer for you. Historically, find a scapegoat, find a distraction, find somebody that, uh, something that people will rally around and forget about the fact that you may be declining in other areas. And one of those things would be uh, turning up the jets on uh, Taiwan, wouldn't it? Sure. I mean, and that, I mean, and that's one of the one of the fears is that is that Taiwan becomes becomes an excuse for for taking attention away from from the the economic problems and the social problems that that go along with the lack of of information and the lack of of, of voice in in uh, uh, government policies or in in national policy. And and uh, you know, I think that that certainly. That is something that that uh, the party has looked at. Now the question is, you know, have they have they gone to the point where they feel that they have to have Taiwan to to satisfy some abstract, uh, you know, rejuvenation goal that the party has set? I, I think that's still the the, the the sort of the open question: is is how how committed are they to a a a takeover of China or a, a return, in their terms, a return of Taiwan to the rightful sovereign owner of, of Taiwan, that is mainland China or the party, the CCP. And I think that, that that's, that's, is still an, an open question. And I think there's, there's concerns in, in the leadership in China that they can really do that, that they really have the capacity to do that. So you, you see these mixed signals of, of sending jets into into uh, Taiwan airspace, and at the same time, you have this this attempt to create economic relations between uh, uh, the, the province the, the provinces on on the east on the uh, on the on the east coast with Taiwan. 
you know, so so you 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 have these these competing competing uh, sort of initiatives that that reflect that that conflicted view of how how they really have to deal with Taiwan. You know, it, it it only occurs to me now talking with you, Carl, that the longer um, they can keep the bubble machine working on threatening Taiwan, the better off they are. If they actually attack with a kinetic war, Taiwan, um, the the benefit of the distraction changes. Mm -hmm. And the people of China may not think it's a really wonderful idea to get into a war with the Chinese people in Taiwan. Uh, and so probably the best move is to keep a pot boiling oh, over a long time. Well, it, it's a, the, the best the best strategy you mean for the party. Yeah, that, that, that they they I, I, and I think that's right. I think that that the leadership recognizes that, uh, you know, I mean, go back, go back 10 years. You know, and and the the discourse about Taiwan was we recognize the need to satisfy the people of Taiwan. You know, for whatever that's worth, there's there's been a recognition for some time that you have to have the the, the people in Taiwan willing to accept that CCP leadership. And I think they understand they they don't have that, and they see what happens in Ukraine. They they see that. You know, I mean, if they just look at all the American failures in in Iraq and Afghanistan, trying to trying to do not something completely dissimilar to that, uh, you know, then they I think they they recognize the risks associated with with as you say this kinetic effort to to actually take control of Taiwan. So I think that's why you know I think it, the U.S. U.S. Uh, def defense uh, department and 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 thinkers of how to defend Taiwan have come to the realization that this prickly defense, you know, a very, a very strong, a very resilient sort of uh, defense of the, of the island of, called Taiwan is certainly a better strategy than trying to, trying to build some sort of a, a capability that would involve naval vessels and, and airplanes and all that. Yeah. Well, that, you know, that really does take us to what the United States is doing. Uh, to contain China, I guess that probably is the right word, contain China uh, in that area generally, uh, and whether it's um, working. I mean, the quad sounds like a good idea. Um, the, uh, you know, Joe Biden's trip to Vietnam sounds like a good idea. Um, it's, it's not without, you know, negative implications also, but um, bottom line is the U.S. seems more active now. It's almost like a uh, uh, Barack Obama's pivot is actually finally pivoting <laughs> in terms of paying attention. Well, I mean, certainly, certainly, uh, what China has done, both economically and militarily, in and, and militarily, very broadly speaking, because a lot of what they've done in Southeast Asia is not militarily as much as it is, you know, mil militia. Uh, uh, Coast Guard, law enforcement in South China Sea, you know, euphemisms for what militaries normally do. Uh, you know, they've they've certainly gotten the attention of the United States and they've gotten the attention of their neighbors. And that's why I think why why India, as you were saying, Vietnam, Philippines are all looking at at the United States as a source of security in the context of, of a, a over aggressive China in the South China Sea. And certainly Taiwan has, has uh, they've gotten the attention of the, of the leadership in Taiwan that there is a risk of a military conflict with China. And so they've certainly started taking their, their own defense uh, much more seriously than they had for the last couple of decades. Well, uh, is our policy good? Is it working? Is it the smartest thing we can do right now? Well, I, actually, I, I, I Think we could do better. I mean, I think I think we could we could do better. And by doing better, what I think we could do is develop our own global narrative. Because right now, what 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 we have is we have, as I mentioned earlier, you know, China has the Global Development Initiative, the Global uh, uh, Security Initiative, the Global Cultural Initiative. And you can disagree with with the content of it, but we, when you're in the rest of the world, you look at the United States and, and what is their counter to these to these global initiatives? 
and the, and the counter right now is a, a deterrence uh, narrative and a containment narrative, as you suggest. And, and that isn't very attractive, I think, if, you're, if you live in Southeast Asia or if you live in the Middle East or if you live in Africa. I think you would like to see a narrative by the United States that suggests how do you how do you develop a, a counter to the economic benefits associated with working with China? What is it? What is the economic benefit of of working with the United States, of collaborating with the United States, when when the United States is is sort of taking a, a, a sort of Chinese kind of line of restricting trade? of eliminating uh, or increasing tariffs and, and making it more difficult to do trade and, and develop economic relations with the United States. So, you know, so I think that, that that's one of the things that, that we've always come up short on is, is the economic side of, of the, the relationships with the rest of the world. And, you know, we have the, the Indo-Pacific economic framework that the Biden administration has been working on. And, it it offers some opportunities for for clean energy transition, for for you know the development of uh, intercon interconnectivity in the region. You know, in, in in India, of course, you know Biden announced the, uh, the the corridor that you're talking about with India for for development in in that part of the world, and and those are those are efforts, but they certainly pale in comparison with what we could do. To, to develop a stronger economic policy that would look to the rest of the world like there is there are advantages to working with the United States both economically and then of course militarily is, 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 is almost becomes a secondary benefit to that. What we have now is we have way too much emphasis, I think, on, on the, the military side of the relationships. And because of that, the, the Southeast Asians are some some of the Southeast Asian countries specifically Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, uh, Indonesia have been reluctant to sign on to a stronger relationship with the United States because they're worried about uh, the, the balance they're trying to maintain with taking advantage of Chinese economic relationships and the U.S. military relationships. Now, we have independent press that reports the problems in Congress all day long. And uh, these guys read the American press and they say, hmm, can we rely on this country? Um, mm -hmm. You know, the politics are, you know, overwhelming and, uh, and, and very threatening in the country and to anyone who wants to depend on the country. And finally, I would say that when you talk about the dichotomy between, you know, military strategies, military, call it military diplomacy, <laughs> my term, military diplomacy. Yeah, yeah. Um, versus, um, you know, trade diplomacy, soft power and all that. Uh, the difference in terms of government in this country is that if you give a trillion dollars to the military and say, here, do things that are military, you know, within the wheelhouse of the military, then they can go out and do a lot of things without getting a lot of congressional approval. They just, you know, treat it as part of their mission. But if you talk about trade policy and trade agreements, you need more help from Congress. And Congress is in isolation mode. Congress isn't helping the administration on these things. And, and Congress doesn't look so good to third parties who want to rely on it. And so I think that's probably got to be a factor. Do you agree? Oh, I agree. I think you know, a large part of the problem is, is the the, the legislative branch in the United States is, is fixated on, on internal divisiveness and and internal internal domestic political issues and it's and it certainly it hurts our foreign policy you know but i will say i will say this that you know one of the one of the points of agreement in the united states today is that we need to do something about china there's not there's not necessarily agreement about what but there certainly is agreement that china is a problem and and we need to do something <laughs> well we send people over there and they and they talk nice but I, you know, wonder your thoughts about um, you know these visits by the State Department and uh, other you know agencies of the administration um, going over to China and and trying to break bread. I think it doesn't go yeah. too far beyond that, actually. And and saying hello, does that help? Well, I, well sure. I think I, it always helps to talk. 
I think, uh, you know, and, and so Gina Raimondo was, was there, you know, she, she did what she had to do. I think she was trying to deliver a message that it isn't all competition, that, that we, we, do have, we do have a trade relationship and it's a huge one, you know, and, and we need to work through some of these issues. And I think that that's, that's healthy. I think, I think that sends a better signal to, again, to the rest of the world. Uh, never mind the dynamic between between the bilateral relationship. You know, I think that by by making the effort to engage in a dialogue, I think sends a better signal to the rest of the world that it isn't all about the competition, that it isn't all about containment. Because that, those we we use that word, but you know, to the rest of the world, that containment strategy sounds very much like the old Cold War strategy. And of course, that's what the Chinese in their narrative use against the United States, that you guys are still living in the Cold War and we need to get beyond that. And I think that that's, and that's a legitimate challenge for the United States to think about how do you get beyond this, this very narrow deterrence mindset that says we have to contain a military power China. What we really need to do is we need to do better than China, not, not, not contain China, but we need to do better than China in our engagement with the rest of the world. And that's where we fail. And that's where our Congress has, has failed us. I think our legislative branch has not been very proactive in that area. So going back to your point, exactly. It's easy to just throw money at the military and then, yeah, everything looks like a nail when you've got a hammer in your hand. Yeah, one thing strikes me from what you said is that if we send uh, diplomats and, you know, and, and fiscal managers and the like, uh, trade managers over to China, uh, we're extending something. We're extending an olive branch. We're extending a willingness to talk, engage, improve, uh, you know, just shoulder to shoulder, at least to some extent. And our people are going there. Query, Carl, are they coming here? Is she coming here? I don't remember she ever coming to the United States. Um, wouldn't it be better if leaders actually went? Sure. Sure, I, there's no doubt. I mean, you know, and and we pretty much know that that's not going to happen with APEC uh, this this fall. You know, I think that uh, you know he's, he's made it clear that that he won't be he won't be attending. You know, and 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 again, that's that's you know, I think part of the Chinese strategy is they're not going to walk away from these Western institutions, but they're also going to build their own network. So you have you know you have the BRICS, you have the you have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that's continuing to expand its membership. You continue to have uh, China work with Russia, you know, in in, in maintaining a real an economic relationship. And this this is very much part of that Chinese strategy to to capture the world wor the part of the world that is not willing to work with the United States or not 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 I shouldn't say not willing to work with the United States, but willing to find alternatives to the Western institutions, you know, and so I think we need to be very aware of that, that, that there is another, another set of mechanisms that continues to grow and, and you need to find ways to, to compete with those institutions in a way that's meaningful for the rest of the world. We can't, we can't just say, well, too bad. We, we, China doesn't want to join these institutions. Russia is, is excluded from these institutions. We're going to move on and pretend that, that this is good enough because it's, I don't think it is because the rest of the world, specifically Africa, the Middle East, you know, have looked at, at China as, as a way to move away from dependence and reliance on, on the United States and the West. And, and so I think that, that, that that's our real challenge when we look at China is, is we need to do better than China. We shouldn't be thinking about China is, is competition and we have to, we have to defeat and, and contain China as much as we need to do better than China. Yeah, boy, do I agree with you about a thousand percent on that. The opportunity is there. We have, we have the money, the resources, we have the talent to do it. All we have to you know, honor is the political will to do it. And that means Congress again. And anyway, so I, I'm thinking that um, that people and the world in general uh, has got to be getting tired of um, China's, uh, you know, affinity uh, with Putin because Putin is just 
showing himself over and over again to be a monster and a war criminal and a you know totally negative uh, element on the stage whichever way the stage is going uh putin is a is a wise guy and and a monster uh, and can china afford to get closer to him is this something that is going to deteriorate is is she going to wake up one day and say i'm spending too much time and political capital on dealing with that guy I'm going to cool it with him. I'm not going to support him in any obvious way. Um, what do you think? Well, I, no, I think I think I think China and and I I, I would never pretend that I speak for uh, Xi Jinping, but I think I think that the the Chinese leadership I'll do it that way. I think the Chinese leadership see Putin as 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 problematic, but Russia as an opportunity. In other words. You know, if you think about how how you play Wei Qi or, or Japanese Go, you know, I mean, that's that's let's let's think about Chinese strategy that way, and and you see the opportunity to integrate those natural resources from Russia into a stronger economy in China, and then you say, yeah, Putin is 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 a nuisance. We don't we don't agree with with his his brutality. We don't we don't necessarily like him, but we can tolerate him because Putin is going to die. I mean that's just the fact that he's a he's a human being and so he's he's going to fade from the scene at some point we don't necessarily care how but russia is something that china has always looked at you know i mean when you look at the history of china the 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 the, the, the hordes from russia have always been competitors and the, and there's always been competition between china and russia in central asia and and uh, that that Part of the world, so you know, I think that that China wants to see this whole oper this relationship with with Russia as an opportunity, a long term opportunity, and Putin is is a short term annoyance. I would I would characterize it that way, and I think that that that's why uh, she sort of tolerates Putin. He he puts forth a show with Putin, but he doesn't get overly uh, comfortable with with Putin. Is there a dynamic? Is it more or is it less? Um, as as Putin gets, mm, you know, more hard to take. Um, do oh, you it gets, think it gets that... more. Sure, it gets more and more difficult for China to maintain maintain that 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 long term perspective, just like it would with with anyone, you know. But I think that I think that that that's that's the long term strategy. And if you understand that, then if there was an opportunity to eliminate Putin from the scene, China would probably not resist and would probably take the opportunity to facilitate something. One other thing I wanted to uh, ask you about, Carl, is that, you know, when when um, I became, personally, when I became aware of the emergence of China, China of, uh, under Hu Jintao, I guess, the capitalization of China and um, cap capitalism, you know, the Chinese capitalism emerging, I was I was very optimistic. I, I thought that um, you know we could have a great relationship with them, and the old notion, the nineteenth nineteenth uh, century sand pebbles experience, you know, American uh, rough capitalism running all over China and pushing it around, you know, um, that was like over, and now China, in its own words, uh, was standing up. And it 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 um, it dominated Chinese thought there for a while that uh, it would stand up. Well, it is it is standing up. It has tremendous you know power and resources and success. Um, that's the, that's the basic narrative over the past twenty years. Um, and then she comes in and he gets tough. He gets brutally tough. And he's pushing around all the neighbors and pushing around, you know, everybody that he can, and uh, including the people in China. And I say to myself, this isn't what we had hoped 20 years ago. Um, you know, when I visited China, which was almost 20 years ago, well, my last time was 2008, um, I, I was optimistic, but I am not optimistic now because he's just a tough guy. And um, and our relationship has deteriorated. 
And so my question to you, and, and at the same time, Carl, I would, I personally, and a lot of people like me, would love to see a healthy, uh, even affectionate, a relationship developed between the United States and China. And maybe I'm taking too much American propaganda here, but um, I, I feel that the, the, the thing standing in the way is this tough guy thing we have going on in China right now. Do you, do you think that we could ever achieve that through soft power and a combination of uh, containment and, and um, you know, doing a better job, as you said? Um, do you think we could ever achieve that, really be friends with them and, and together um, create a better world? Well, I, I mean, I think I, I agree with a lot of what you say is that we've, I think we've all been disappointed in, in how things have turned out. And, and certainly uh, a big part of the problem is, is what, what Xi Jinping has done with, with his, his role as the, as the leader of the party. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to meet, I'm going to maintain my optimism that I think we, we can do better. And unfortunately, you know, it's probably going to take longer than we thought. I mean, it's, you know, I think, I think in the, in the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, we all thought this was going to work well and that, that China was going to develop as a, as a more democratic uh, country. And, and that we would have we would have free flow of, uh, of goods back and forth and and everybody would benefit so I, I I appreciate that sentiment but I think you know just as just as Xi Jinping sees Putin as as a somewhat inconvenient partner at this point I think we we could see China the same way that the people in China aren't happy with what's happening either I think that 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 we're going to have to see how that plays out domestically, how, how, the, how the Chinese deal with this problem. You know, historically, what's happened in China when you have the emperor that gets, that gets old and stops listening, you know, then you have, then you have a, a new emperor, you know. And, and so I think that, that we sort of need to look beyond Xi Jinping. He, just like Putin, has, has a, 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 an expiration date. And, you know, and, and as that expiration date comes, Maybe there's some way for a, a renewed attempt at, at a better form of democracy in China, because they're suffering from that, that, that same disease that all autocracies suffer from, is the lack of information, the lack of responsiveness to, to the will of the people. And if you believe in, in, in democracy and, and, and the, rule of, the rule of the people, then I think you, you have to have some optimism that China will eventually work its way past this, this uh, Xi Jinping era and, and hopefully develop a, a kinder, gentler form of, of governance and a kinder and gentler form of, of relations with its neighbors and the rest of the world. From your lips to God's ears, Carl. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's not, that's not easy to say right now, because I think, you know, we, we, we haven't, I don't think we've reached the bottom of the relationship yet. I think we still have a ways to go. And there has to, there's going to have to be some cathartic event that, that uh, sort of frees us up from this, this, this spiral. And, and, you know, and as, as we mentioned, you know, hopefully that's not an, that's not a war in Taiwan, or it's not some catastrophic event. Or you know maybe maybe it's maybe it's sudden realization that we really do need to do something about climate change that we really do need to do something about uh, you know about about the deterioration of the environment. Uh, you know. But it almost it almost seems like it's going to take some some big cathartic event to make this happen. I totally agree. Well, such wisdom here on Think Tank. Thank you so much, Carl. Really okay. appreciate your thoughts on these things. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha.